It's time for the best of the rest and our last batch of games before we return to Nintendo Power Magazine proper. Now, before we get started, I do need to give a few mentions of some of the games which were mentioned in the now playing columns that never got a U.S. release at all, um, or for that matter, any release at all, um, which are not getting covered. I may cover them at some point in the future, if, like the import ones that have gotten a more complete translation. Um, as far as fan translation, but the prototypes less so. It, I'm comparing these games and reviewing these games in comparison with completely with completed and fully released games. Certainly, some of these games are probably very, very far along or even in a near complete state by the time that they were cancelled or what have you. But I don't think it's necessarily a fair comparison. I mean, certainly at least one of the games here this episode. I could see a incomplete prototype possibly having a good chance of beating it. But otherwise, less so. I don't like shifting the goalposts in this regard. So, the games which were in the now playing column and ultimately did not get a release at all in the West or otherwise are Godzilla Destroy All Monsters, a Godzilla fighting game which only got a Japanese release. It did come out, but again, Japan only. Um, the Shadow, a beat 'em up game based on the film, which was also released but has had a prototype leaked. Power Drive, a racing game which only came out in Europe, and Apocalypse Two, a shoot 'em up which also never came out but had a beta version released as a reproduction cartridge by Hyperkin. Um, again, not covering those games. I might take a look at the prototypes or the didn't make it in the West. Video uh, games for a future video, something along the lines of uh, didn't make it here. Something that just kind of covering all the previewed but unreleased in the U.S. but well, did get released elsewhere. Games and kind of a import roundup sort of thing. I like this would be also include like Terra Enigma and stuff as well. So let us begin. Breakthrough is the next game to come out of Alexei Pajitnov, creator of Tetris. The mechanic of the games are decent. It's like clusters of blocks, two or more in size, to eliminate them from the board. This will cause the blocks above them to drop down in order to open up additional combos, and then you proceed until the board is clear or time expires. If time expires before you've cleared the board, you lose a life. The problem is somewhat twofold. First, instead of doing what a lot of other similar games do under the circumstances, which is raise additional rows of blocks up from the bottom of the screen um, in a pattern that's set by the game, which allows it to basically seed blocks in order to prevent an unwinnable state. The game drops additional blocks from the top of the screen in like twos, threes, and fours, and not necessarily in a set pattern, and not necessarily in set positions, meaning that it is possible to fairly easily and fairly early get a unwinnable board state, leaving you like sitting around for like five or six minutes with a board that you can't actually do anything with and no way to just quit out without restarting the entire cartridge. Similarly, you have little to no control when and where the next set of blocks will drop. You can, if you've narrowed down the size of your, your board, you can slide them back and forth that way, but that's pretty much it. Um, and again, without knowing when the next blocks are going to drop, it's and where they'll be located when that happens, that doesn't help you very much. It's a decent concept of a game, but there again, there's no way to take an unwinnable board state and turn it winnable, leaving you just sitting around and waiting for the time to expire and you to be able to start over. And presumably a sequel could have fixed some of the issues this game presents, but I don't think we ever got it. And the concept itself has been adapted to a whole bunch of other puzzle console games for consoles, portable systems, and mobile devices, among other places. So I can't really s side with picking up this game over the numerous alternate takes on the concept out there that are executed better. Carrier Aces could have been a really neat World War II aerial dogfighting game, except for one real problem. It's only one-on-one, -on -one, which generally means in any involved air combat situation, once an enemy gets out from in front of you, at least in single player, then you basically end up flying in circles, avoiding the enemy who's gotten behind you, 
without any real tools to turn things around, literally or figuratively. Like, I looked at the controls, found control options for doing a, 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 a loop to, you know, get in front of the enemy plane, but no, or, or I should say, get the enemy plane in front of you, but no, it didn't work, I couldn't pull it off, or for some reason, entering the command wasn't doing anything. So, like, that basically means you're in a situation where you are literally flying in circles with no way to line up on a target, no way for the target to line up on you, and it makes the game boring. And on top of all of this, part of the reason why this doesn't work is pilots have wingmen. There's another, normally another pilot watching your back, and that's a thing that can get you out of situations like this, or use something to do by getting your wingman out of situations like this. And this is a thing which other games for the Super Nintendo, in particular Wing Commander, have figured out already. And yes, Wing Commander was a PC game first, but the point is, it got a Super Nintendo version, we've already covered it years previously in Nintendo Power Time, so what's Carrier Ace's excuse? The itchy and scratchy game feels somewhat directionless. On the one hand, the main body of the level each game as you're playing is itchy and beating the crap out of Scratchy until you reach the end of the level, go through a door and run into a boss, which is not remotely related to Scratchy or any plan he has, and you which you fight. And if you lose the fight, then you start the level over from the very beginning. Uh gives a really significant disconnect between the main body of the level and the boss fight. Yes, the bosses are thematically connected to the level, but they aren't connected to what you're doing in each level. And this isn't helped by a lack of communication on whether you're having any effect on the boss of each level by, you know, attacking them or anything. Or, for that matter, whether or not you, what you do when fighting Scratchy has any impact on fighting the boss at all, or if it's just there because, oh, it's an Itchy and Scratchy game, you, you're, you're itch, you need to play Itchy and fight Scratchy. Micro Machines has less of a difficulty curve and more of a difficulty cliff. First couple of races of the game are pretty much a cakewalk, and then it gives you a track so then two adjoining desks with a track that hugs the edge of the desks, and then gives you a huge time setback if you fall off. And on top of all of that, gives you cars that accelerate very quickly and which decelerate very slowly. So generally, your opponents will hit their lines more or less correctly unless you bump off the side of the desk, while you will, while learning the track and burning all your lives in the process, will go hurtling into the abyss, costing you significant chunks of time, like up to like five or six seconds or more. Ultimately, this makes it for a game with really great style, but somewhat frustratingly lacking controls. Home Improvement is something of a, a dumpster fire of a game. The controls and weapons are poorly designed, with the character's stock attack being at a 45 degree upward angle, and the power-ups basically being some form of spread shot, or a change of weapon with a splash damage later on in the first level. That, combined with some pretty rough platforming, makes this a game that's really not worth anyone's time, no matter how good the writing may or may not be, and I do appreciate, at least for like the opening cutscene of the game, that it does evoke the sense of the, of the tool time areas of the game, um, what those chunks of the show are like. Power Instinct is a pretty standard fighting game with some character to it of a not-too-campy variety, does interesting character archetypes and, pre and a fun presentation, but it doesn't go as far over the top as, for example, uh, World Heroes does. Though, unfortunately, from doing some research into the game, the US release gutted some significant portions of that game's presentation, in particular, the game's endings. And doing further research, no one's really done the work yet to patch the Japanese release's endings into the US version of the game with new translations. So that's a pretty big bummer. And all of this installment, I'm going to go with Power Instinct as my game of the episode. It was a fighting game which I had a real blast with. I, not just in terms of, oh, I guide a lot of progress in it, but, like, it is a game with some neat visual flair and stylistic music touches and that sort of thing. Um, and I really dug that. I also got some sequels as well. Um, the second game in the series came out for the PlayStation, and I believe it did get a U.S. release, so I may have to hunt that down on my own as well. But next time, though, it is episode 100, 
and the start of Nintendo Power's eighth year. I'll see you then. Hey, yeah.